So I'm going to talk on love here, but it's important to note that all I say here only makes sense within the context of eternal existence or eternal consciousness or eternal life. I explain with breathtaking clarity elsewhere why eternal consciousness is the eternal situation for the living unified field. I explain why death of consciousness, death of experience, is an absolute logical impossibility. I explain why eternal existence is not at all a wish fulfillment fantasy, but rather a hard and inescapable fact. And as I say, I explain this with breathtaking clarity. If you haven't seen that explanation and don't feel inclined to take my word for it here, then I suggest you stop watching this video and go view that one before you continue. It's easy enough to find. I've been invested for quite some time in the idea that love is the answer to our human problems here, both at the individual level and the collective level. Existential questions like this are doomed to incoherency while they're asked from the assumption that we are mortal. Let me make a nice, bold, hard, flat statement for you. Nothing, nothing at all, makes the slightest sense outside of the context of eternal existence. If you're not there yet, then you're not caught up enough for this video. So go sort yourself out. If you are caught up enough, if you do get what I'm talking about here, then you can understand the importance, the crucial significance of this thing called love. For those who believe they are a fleeting, mortal scrap of existence, living a finite life that will be over and done with soon enough, then it makes perfect sense for you to try and grab for yourself whatever facsimile of love you can before you are dead and gone and incapable of receiving love ever again. When one is free of this misconception, this direct inversion of truth, when you recognize you are never ever going to get out of existing, then facsimiles of love become the opposite of what we wish for and seek for ourselves, Because we know we are faced with the prospect of an eternity, the quality of which will be determined by our choices. Nobody who understands they are eternal and cannot get out of it wishes for their eternity to be anything but filled with as much love as possible. If you do not recognize yourself as eternal, there may be little point in you listening to me talk about love, because you do not even know just how important to you love is in the first place. As far as you are concerned, you'll be gone tomorrow anyway. So, that's my context of eternity disclaimer. Let's proceed, shall we? Let's talk about love. I had a go at building a website one time. I felt I had a mission, a vision, to promote love as pretty much the answer to all our problems. The website is still there to be looked at, but 
I didn't maintain the energy levels to keep adding to it for very long. So all but one page has been stagnant for years. The central concept that was the spark for my love activist website was if everybody knows full well that love is the thing they wish for most, why do we have so much difficulty embodying love as individuals and as a society, a culture? Why? What's the matter with us? Why should we find it so difficult? To the point where the very thing we long for most becomes almost mythical in its elusiveness. Why is true love, the unconditional kind, so rare in our culture? Why is it that when national or international calamities occur, the focus of discussion goes straight to morality rather than love? For sure, we talk about love endlessly in our movies and novels and songs and what have you, because it is that important to us. But when world calamities call for our attention, we talk morality, always morality, never love. So, why, why, why? We are blocking our own love, clearly, self-evidently, beyond a doubt. We are blocking the very thing we wish for. Why are we doing this? And what would help? Clearly, I can only offer my own personal perspective. Love is strange because it is both universal and utterly unique in its expression at one and the same time. So I must give my unique take on our universal shared concern. So let's start with, is love even a real thing at all? And if it is, what exactly is that thing? Well, love is an emotion. What do we think of emotions? Lie culture, which is the culture we all live in all around the world. Well, it tells us conflicting things about emotions. On the one hand, we are told that happy and loving people are good people. On the other hand, we are told that emotional people are weak, unstable, unreliable. Lie culture has this remarkable way of making our own dreams impossible. We long to be happy, loving, loved, and these are emotions. To feel these things is to be emotional. But the most obvious way to resist the other emotions, the more challenging and unpleasant emotions, is to reduce our sensitivity to all of them. So our emotions are presented as a problem to be solved. What model of reality shall I embrace that will allow me to feel only the good emotions? And there isn't one. Love and fear are polar partners that define one dimension of emotionality. To be sensitive enough on this dimension to feel love is by default, by necessity, by reality, to be sensitive enough to feel fear. To feel fear is not a weakness, and it is not a failing of personal character. 
a parent can be filled with love at the sight of their child walking along the edge of a stream and they can be correspondingly filled with fear when they see that child stumble by the water's edge. This is not a failing. It is not something to be fixed. Neither is not feeling love a flaw in your character. The fear informs us. The love informs us. The lack of love or fear informs us. Emotions are not a problem to be solved. They are information. Precious, precious, invaluable information to be used. Our emotions are there for us. They seek to give us so much. It is their very function to guide us. Those spiritual models of understanding that hold unending bliss, unending peace, unending joy, unending positive emotion, and nothing but positive emotion, as their goal, they are broken. They do not understand eternity. They do not understand oscillation. They do not understand the essential function of emotions for the living unified field. Now, of course, of course, of course, the emotions that tell us something hideous and painful is happening to us are hideous and painful, and we wish to stop feeling them at the soonest possible opportunity. But the problem is not the hideous emotions. The hideous emotions are simply pointing at the problem for us. As much as we might wish eternity to hit a point after which no emotion is felt that is not pleasant, or at least neutral, it is not a good thing to wish for. A problem-free eternity might seem like the most obvious thing for any eternal being to wish for. But no, a problem-free eternity would not be nice for us. It would not. We would hate it in no time at all. And then that would be the great problem. So, love, if it is an emotion, and if emotions inform us, what is love informing us when it is there? What is love telling us when we do feel it? Love tells us yes, just as fear tells us no. Love tells us yes. You see how uncomplicated it is. Yes, I like that. I say yes to that. I wish for more of that. Because I like it that much. And yes, for sure, it's easy enough to go too far in that direction. Which will lead to problems which your faithful emotions will faithfully point out to you. The most stable form of love is not to be found at the extremities of the love-fear dimension, and it is not to be found in the centre. The centre is simply equilibrium. The most stable form of love is to be found when one's sensitivity to it is centred around the centre. In other words, you extend your emotional sensitivity out in all directions, and you feel all they have to tell you. Fearful feelings guide you away from that which you do not wish for more of, and your loving feelings guide you towards that which you do desire more of.
And they can only do this if you are willing to feel and sincerely consider all of your emotions, not just the ones you like best. And of course, our lie culture tells us over and over and over again, you're not safe to do that, not around here. It's not safe to love, not in these parts. The proof is all around you. Something to understand about our lie culture. A lot of the time, perhaps most of the time, it believes its own lies. And it lies, consciously or unconsciously, agrees to believe lies, out of fear. And because it doesn't know any better. Our children, for example, they believe our lies because, one, they're children, they don't know any better, and two, they wish to please us, because that tends to feel better to them rather than worse. So as we are taught over and over again that we are at fault when we feel negative emotions, and we are unsafe to feel love, we become acceptable to lie culture, and we perpetuate it for our children. And love, that thing which feels the best and results in the best, becomes the rarity rather than the commonplace. The thing that feels the best and results in the best becomes a rarity by order of our own culture. It becomes a thing we should no longer expect for ourselves. And in the absence of it, we are encouraged to grab onto and guard jealously whatever we can find that looks most like what it is supposed to look like. And so we live our lives. But how could it have been otherwise? For a child to grow into an adult who walks confidently and securely in their own love. What else do they need right from the start but parents who understand and embody their own love? And none of us have had this. Some of us may have had something that could be said to be closer than what most others have had. But lie culture is lie culture. To be a privileged slave is still to be a slave. The great and mythical optimal love that we all secretly suspect somewhere within us is possible. The heart of it, the start of it, is self-love. The unconditional kind. The kind we like best. Self-love. And lie culture teaches us to doubt ourselves, criticize ourselves, hate ourselves. Lie culture teaches us that we are unworthy of love unless we somehow prove ourselves to be worthy. And lie culture teaches us that even if we prove ourselves to be worthy, we still may not get it. Because there just isn't that much of it out there. Lie culture teaches us to get something that looks like love and be grateful for it looking like love. The only reason we are even able to accept this lie is because we haven't tasted for ourselves the real, unconditional thing. Because obviously, if you have tasted it, you know what it tastes like and can no longer be lied to about it. So, what does it taste like? And here's the thing to understand. Love does not make sense from the perspective of a mortal mindset because 
Life does not make sense from a mortal mindset. The mortal mindset tells us this. Life comes into being, lives for a bit, then dies. In other words, the mortal mindset tells us that life is meaningless and frightening. From your point of view, if you hold the mortal mindset, everything before you were conceived is as nothing to you because you weren't there. And whatever happens after you die is as nothing to you because you won't be here. And everything you have experienced while being alive will soon be as nothing to you because you won't be here anymore. The mortal mindset witnesses those who live lives of great misfortune and suffering and can only conclude that existence is cold and unsympathetic and requires that one be strategic in the face of that if one isn't to suffer meaninglessly oneself. The entire subject of love means very different things to a mortal outlook than to an eternal outlook. For a mortal outlook, love is meaningless because life itself is meaningless. Our culture, our lie culture, struggles to talk about love meaningfully, struggles to talk about it without cynicism. And it's no wonder because so, so many of us feel so, so terribly bitter about the whole subject. And with good reason. You see this baby Yanto here. He hasn't been told yet that he is mortal. In his entire life, as a baby Yanto, so far, he has not had a single thought of life ending. All he knows is constant change, and some of it feels better, some of it feels worse. In other words, in terms of the basics, the fundamentals of cognitive development, he has what he needs in order to move forward in this world. So what thoughts does baby Yanto have if he hasn't enough experience of life here yet to have thoughts of that life ending? I remember being a baby. Most people I have talked to say they don't. I don't know how it is for you. But I remember being a baby. Some of it. And I remember the two core questions I was perpetually asking and re-asking. These two questions were. What's happening? What feels better rather than worse? They were my two core abiding concerns. They still are today. These are the two core abiding concerns of the field in general, and any of its parts in particular. They are your two core abiding concerns. They just don't switch off. Even if you're feeling great. What's happening now? And what would feel better rather than worse? Now, at the adult human level of complexity, the answers to these two core questions at any given time can be all kinds of subtle, mysterious and confusing. At the level of baby Yanto, well, he just wants the basics right now, the fundamentals. At the level of baby Yanto, a strong, coherent answer to his first question, what's happening? would have been you are the eternal one I am freshly arrived here we are also the eternal one I am we've just been here a little bit longer than you we'll show you how this place works but there was nobody there able to tell baby Yanto that was there for you A good, strong, coherent answer to his second question, what would feel better rather than worse, would have been love, 
your own self-love. And we will show you how that works. At baby Yanto level, that is the answer he deserved. The answer that would help him make sense of himself and his situation. But there was nobody there able to tell him that. Was there for you? Was there for your parents? Is it something you think you understand now? As I say, the whole subject of why you can be certain you are eternal is covered elsewhere, with breathtaking clarity. We don't need to worry about that here. But this subject of self-love, it is the holy grail of understanding when it comes to experiencing the great love, the great unconditional love, that love we can't help but desire. And it only makes sense within the context of inescapable eternal existence. But then everything only makes sense within the context of inescapable eternal existence. So, self-love. Were you taught what self-love means within the context of eternal existence by parents who knew what they were doing? I'm telling you that you were not. And you should have been. You deserved to be. And you would have been if you could have been at the time. But there wasn't anybody there who was able. And you still do deserve it. We all do. So I guess I'd better do the best I can. For the mortal-minded who is steeped in lie culture, the concept of unconditional love does not work, does not make sense. What? I would love this person no matter what hurtful things they do? No thank you. I'll avoid that trap, if you don't mind. The problem for the mortal-minded who are steeped in lie culture is that they wouldn't recognise a trap if they were in one, and they don't. Baby Yanto didn't. I remember, I remember being a child of five or less who was both romantically and erotically charged. I was, I remember. And baby Yanto's father taught him that he was laughable for both and should feel acutely self-conscious to the point of feeling ashamed and guilty for even having such feelings. Now I know we have all had different experiences of being parented, some more unpleasant than others. The unpleasantness that our lie culture teaches has its own spectrum of form and its own range of intensity, from very mild, barely perceptible, to extreme. And yes, the nicer aspects are more pleasant than the terrible extreme aspects. By comparison to the most terrible aspects of lie culture, the milder aspects may seem downright euphoric. And in the absence of anything more coherent to choose from, they may seem the most desirable things in the world. But a lie is a lie. It does not bring the thing it says it will bring. It just pretends. The details of the lies Baby Yanto was told will vary from the details Baby You was told. Baby Yanto's life circumstances were unique to him, just as yours are to you. But the underlying lie we are told by lie culture, ultimately, is the same one. We are ultimately small, fleeting 
and worthless, no matter how many other people we manage to get under our feet for a time. Baby Yanto's experience of this was, well, I'm one of those guys who has been both romantically and erotically charged since he was a small child, but didn't manage to lose his virginity until he was 24. I was one of those young men who haven't had any and would die of shame if he was forced to admit it. There were many times when I wondered if I would ever overcome my own repulsiveness and uselessness. A large part of the reason for that long, seemingly never-ending period of trying to be somebody better than myself is undoubtedly because I wanted it so much. By this point, I just wanted to have sex so that I could say that I had. That, combined with the people around me making it quite clear that I was laughably unworthy of being with any female I felt even remotely attracted to, Combined also with everybody around me having their own version of the great lie as it had been handed down to them to deal with as best they could. This was all more than enough to have me feeling insecure and desperately trying to figure out the rules so that I could try to play by them effectively. When I was 24, I just got so sick and tired of this that I gave up trying at all anymore. And then a few days after that, I met the first woman who would be willing to entertain me. I had had to teach myself the necessity of simply being myself. I had had to teach myself because there had been nobody else around able to, and it had taken me 24 years. The people around me, the culture around me, had explained clearly and reasonably if it comes down to being yourself or following the rules you follow the rules if you know what's good for you you follow the rules i had been trying hard to be what women and the rules required of me but it hadn't come naturally at all which resulted in me not being naturally myself whenever i was anywhere near a girl i fancied Obviously, my story is not generic. Some of my contemporaries found sexual partners or had sexual partners thrust upon them much younger than I. And maybe some of them are still virgins in their 50s. But I maintain that we were all caught up in the effort to please or at least placate the human society we found ourselves surrounded by. We all just wished to feel better rather than worse. And we did not know that nobody around us knew how to teach us how to do this. So many around us never tired of explaining how they did know how to teach us. And as young people, we still didn't fully appreciate just how much Humans will lie and lie and lie and not tell you they are lying for reasons of their own that they also will not tell you. This all produces a cognitive dissonance that we just get used to because it's not like we have any choice. For us, cultural cognitive dissonance is natural. It is, after all, what we were born into. For sure, it's possible something better could be devised, theoretically. But unless everybody else is doing it, what's the point, eh? We wish to be well integrated with and accepted by the culture around us here and now. That's what seems to feel better rather than worse to us. We feel so natural to ourselves that we simply do not see how much we lie to ourselves. And so parents lie to each other and to their children, and the lies self-replicate throughout society tirelessly. We feel so natural to ourselves that we just do not notice just how much of the time we spend not 
being our own natural selves. Some of us are naturally more self-expressive than others. Some of us are better at being our authentic selves than others. But even those of us who are comparatively good at this still have the world around us to contend with. We are conditioned to pay attention to what behaviour on our part gets us rewarded and what gets us punished. We are not conditioned to pay attention to our own self-approval. And this is a shame and an injustice to our beautiful children and our beautiful selves. 24-year-old Yanto had finally managed to be himself in public and lose his virginity in private. The world of romantic sexual relationship was now open to him. That realm he had so longed to be invited into for pretty much all of his life. A slight tangent here, but let's not beat about the bush. One of the keenest pains of existence is the experience of unrequited love. Unreturned love. And we have all had so much of that. We have. Every single one of us. You can say what you like. I'm telling you, we have. It is no wonder at all that so, so many of us are so, so bitter about the subject of love. The good kind, the real kind, the unconditional kind. It's not that we never get to experience any love at all. It's just that when we do, there always seem to be these strings attached of some form or other. The handful of committed love relationships I've been in, they've all been unique. But it seems kinder to the women involved to talk about my time with them as a conglomeration. Because while each woman was unique, it's what they had in common that I want to talk about. What they had in common was lie culture. And what lie culture tells us about love relationships is that they are transactional. In other words, lie culture tells us that committed love relationships cannot be unconditional. You give me what I want, I give you what you want. As usual, lie culture tells us the perfect opposite the inversion of what is actually so. It really does. And we don't mind. Because we just plumb don't realise it or understand it. We are taught that we are required to prove ourselves as worthy by showing that we can be an effective force of survival and prosperity in the face of the big, tough and unforgiving world we share here. What we are not taught is that we are eternal and that all love that comes to us in our eternity comes to us via our own love for our own eternal self. Self Self-love is the answer we do not wish to hear about because we feel it is an impossibility. Because our culture can't cope with the concept of self-love. Our culture doesn't know how to do it. It does not matter if you don't want to hear it. It doesn't matter how much you may huddle into yourself in fear at the sound of me telling you you're going to have to love yourself. It doesn't matter how much you turn your face away at the idea of having to love something like you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't alter the fact. You saying you can't do it doesn't make the fact that you have to do it go away. Of course, you don't have to do it. You have the freedom of your choices, always. 
When I say that you have to do it, all I really mean is that this is what you have to do, this terribly impossible loving yourself thing, if you don't wish for your eternity to be complete shit. That's all I mean. It is all about self-love. It makes no difference if you don't want to hear it. Tough shit, my friend. Tough shit. You don't want to hear that it's all about self-love? Tough shit, because it is all about self-love. You can run. Of course you can run. But you'll find eternity to be an awfully long marathon. But how, I hear you cry, how am I supposed to love this ugly and bitter and twisted thing? Because you don't know the things I have done, the things I have experienced, the choices I have made, the things I have thought and felt. How can I love this? You have to be kinder than the culture raised you to be kinder to yourself. You have to be more humane than the humans that taught you. More humane with yourself. You were raised by innocent child torturers and so you are a tortured child. And your commitment to your culture renders you into an innocent child torturer yourself. One that will self-replicate the great lie and direct it right at and into your own children. You are not the eternal, my darling. You are small, weak and fleeting. You are almost nothing. And if you are to have anything good at all in your fleeting existence, you must work hard, very hard indeed. And we tell ourselves we are good parents for teaching this. But we are not good parents for teaching that. We are child torturers, creating more tortured children, who will themselves torture children in their turn. Such is our culture. I sometimes dream about having a child. My daughter or son would be told from the first day that they are eternal. And also that the core skill they need to get a handle on at the earliest opportunity is self-love. And I would tell them it is easy. And I would show them how easily I love them. And when they show me how easily they love themselves, they will be showing me how easily I may love myself. The Living Unified Field chooses love naturally, from the start, for want of a better word. Even when this is not identified and understood cognitively, it is understood instinctively. And this is because when it comes to desire, motivation and choice, everybody, everything and anything, no matter how simple and primal, no matter how mysterious and complex, always only wishes to feel better rather than worse. The living unified field always chooses love to the best of its own ability, within the idiosyncratic confines of the truth of the current moment. The living unified field cannot know itself fully. It is always mysterious unto its own self, from its own point of view, as experienced from any given time and location and scale, because of its own infinite nature. 
And so the field can be uncertain about which choice will bring most love. But all of it only wishes to feel better rather than worse. Beneath whatever confusion may be present, the field is always choosing to attempt to choose love. The field can know uncertainty. And when the field is coherent, the field is glad it knows uncertainty. When the field is coherent, it knows both certainty and uncertainty. And when the field is faced with the mystery, sometimes the clarity it seeks is most easily provided by example. The most coherent teacher isn't the one who stands before a classroom. The most coherent teacher is the one who shows freely and clearly what they are doing, why they are doing it, and how they are doing it. Those that are interested may witness this, and those who are not interested may go and witness something they prefer to know about. So, how shall you provide your example to the rest of us? Your example of how you do self-love. How shall you show us how you like to feel better rather than worse? Yes? Because even if we don't even know it yet, really, truly, we can't wait to witness that. We can't wait to witness you bringing yourself without cultural inhibition. All that you can that makes you feel better rather than worse. Unconditional love is not rocket science after all. Of course, that which is foundational has to be foundationally simple. We simply wish the best for everybody. Because we already wish the best for ourselves. That's all unconditional love is, everybody. It's that hard, pure, but low benchmark. It's simpler than pie. You just wish the best for everybody and get on with bringing yourself that which makes you feel better rather than worse. And because we are such beautiful and love-choosing mysteries to our own selves, our journey can only be one of story. You are your own story of your forever seeking to choose love. You write it, you read it, you live it. And when you are coherent, you love it. Like all fundamental things, unconditional love, this thing that might seem a great and elusive mystery, turns out to not be rocket science. And hey, after you've mastered it for yourself, you can go find somebody else who has mastered it for their self, if you like. Imagine actually being with somebody who actually likes their self and wouldn't dream of asking you to be anybody other than yourself. Wow. To be with somebody who sees you, gets you, and for you to still feel safe with them. This means you know it is safe to be yourself. And this is always our prerequisite need. Which tells us exactly why unconditional love is such a big deal. Because it is a primary big deal. And the primary form of unconditional love is unconditional self-love. That is the love from which unconditional love for others can be emergent. Get this. You do not receive unconditional love, which is really the only form of love, from one who does not unconditionally love their own self. So, do you see yourself? 
do you get yourself? And do you still feel safe with yourself? Do you know that you have your back? Because that is unconditional love. As I say, it is not rocket science. You are loving unconditionally when you are there for yourself relentlessly, having your own back, looking out for your own heart's desires, protecting and supporting you, nourishing and encouraging you, all the time, letting yourself know you are cared for. This is the unconditional love to be embraced first and foremost, always. You give me what I want, I give you what you want. This is transactional love. The opposite, the inversion of unconditional love. Unconditional love says, I love myself so much, there's all this overflow. It's getting all over the place. Would you like some? It doesn't matter how much you don't want to hear it. Until you learn to love yourself genuinely, sincerely. None of the good stuff for you. Sorry, darling. Just what exactly is the good stuff? Well, for a start, it's the stuff we feel grief over losing. I'm so glad for my grief. I am glad for my grief. My grief tells me I have loved. My grief tells me I do love. My grief tells me that love is real. If we do not allow ourselves to feel our emotions, we do not allow our emotions to guide us away from that which we do not wish for more of and towards that which we do desire. And what kind of fool would do such a thing as that? If you believe that Being eternal means the attainment of a bliss that is never ending, then you are wrong. But, if you believe that romantic love is a lie, then you are wrong also about that. Lie culture does make romantic love very hard to find. Because lie culture says if it is possibly out there, like Bigfoot or something, then it is probably far, far away out there and it's going to take some finding and let's face it, you are probably not the one to do it. But our love for another does not come from out there. Our love for another does not come from them at all. Their love for us comes from them. Our love for them comes from us. All of the psychological tricks that pickup artists develop and share and implement, they are really nothing more than techniques for mimicking a person who loves their self. You may think that the last person one should wish to be with is somebody who is in love with their self. But really, truly, that is the only person you should wish to be with. Romantic love does exist. It is a real thing. The reason it is rare in our culture is because we do not know how to love ourselves in our culture because our culture does not love us. 
romantic love is rare for us because self-love has to come first. Romantic love follows naturally and sweetly from self-love and not at all from the absence of it. If the self-love isn't there, then your romantic relationships will be a facsimile of the real thing, no matter how you buff and polish the outer appearance. If the self-love is there, then love of all forms will harry and harass you all day long every day. And that might not be so unpleasant. Your love for another is a gift you give yourself. They get no say in it. And they have no duty to take responsibility for it. To love another is the reward in itself. In an eternal existence, to love another is a thing to be cherished. A thing to be supremely grateful for. Whether that love is requited or not. Because you are the one feeling that love. You are the true recipient of that love. Genuine romantic love is rare for us in our culture because self-lovers are rare. How are we supposed to find each other? There are no dating sites for us because there just aren't enough of us to make that financially viable. The love you feel for another is a gift you give to yourself. The beauty you see outside you is your beauty because you are recognizing and appreciating that beauty with your beauty. The beauty you recognize in another is precisely correspondent to the beauty of that recognition, your recognition. Do you understand? If the beauty was not already there within you, you would be literally and definitively incapable of recognizing it outside of you and in another. I'd really like you to take a while to seriously consider what I have just said. Do you recognize beauty when you see it? then you are that beautiful, at least that beautiful. If you can open yourself to just how much beauty you do recognize in the world and its people, while holding the understanding that the beauty you are recognizing with is yours, you will gradually begin to recognize and appreciate the beauty you are appreciating beauty with. And it will become a great source of joy to you. And who knows, you may finally fall in love with that which you recognize inside yourself at last. You may finally understand just how deserving of your own love you have always been. If you've come to feel bad about some of the choices you have made, some of the actions you have taken or not taken, understand, you would not feel bad about these things at all, were it not for the fact that you are beautiful and deserving of all of your own love. You are completely innocent, forever. For the simple reasons that you were never given a choice about being and you never fully understand what's going on and all you ever really wish for is just to feel better rather than worse. And this trilogy of facts, well, it's a lot. It's a huge amount for anyone. For me as much as for you. 
you have nothing to apologise for. You never do. Don't get me wrong. A sincere apology can be a beautiful thing. But ultimately, when all events and experiences are reduced down to their simplest form, you never really need apologise. How shall we apologise for being and doing the best we could at the time? Forgiveness should always come naturally because there is never really anything to forgive. Not when the big picture is beheld and understood. And the big picture is you have zero choice but to be here eternally. You never fully understand what's happening you only ever wish to feel better rather than worse so it's a lot for us for all of us but we do have our moments our moments of unconditional love and these moments they are worth the time and energy it takes us to find them journey towards them, create them, together. It's more than worth it. And so, existence does turn out to be a positive thing rather than a negative, for it is forever a presence and never an absence. You are so beautiful. If you don't recognize that in yourself yet, I encourage you to start paying attention to just how much beauty you are capable of recognizing. And I encourage you to recognize the beauty with which you are recognizing all of this beauty. Because... This is your eternal gift to you. It is the eternal gift you give yourself. And how shall you do this well? While you're slavishly following broken cultural imperatives that tell you you cannot do it. If you are of the romantic persuasion, then you have your two daunting tasks laid out clearly in front of you. First, you need to learn how to love yourself. This will involve stepping out of our culture as much as you can, deprogramming your mind from all of those lies. And then, after you have accomplished that mighty task, You must find and fall in love with somebody else who also loves their self. And you mustn't be a dick about it if they're not interested. So, you've got your work cut out for you. That's quite a lot. I wonder if it'll be worth it. Hmm.